USA Warrior Stories is a not-for-profit organization designed to record, archive, and share videos of veterans' stories to help veterans make a connection with one another and to help us all better understand their sacrifices for our freedoms. But Americans risk and sometimes give all that they have half a world away from home because they know that once again half a world away has become our front door. My mother decided that since the Vietnam War was just beginning to build up and that I should take ROTC at college. So I took ROTC, graduated in June of 63 and uh, a commission as a second lieutenant in the army. And I got assigned adjutant general position as military personnel officer. But there were about 16 other jobs that were part-time jobs, they, they said. And one of them was called survivor's assistance. In this case, uh, if a retired officer died in the Charleston area, uh, uh, and his widow was left not knowing what military benefits she might lose or would continue to ma maintain, uh, she could come up and uh, meet with me, or I'd go out. In this case, the first one, I went out and met with her at her home. She, her husband had died several months earlier, very relaxed, going over the whole situation with her. She baked me some chocolate chip cookies and whatever else and went on my way. Then uh, the first soldier was killed in Vietnam uh, several months after that. The tradition then was the Western Union telegram to the mom and dad in this case. They got the telegram and I had to go out within 48 hours and basically talk to the family. It was, obviously they were still in deep grief, but they already had the major shock out of their way. And I was there in a sense to, to help them to plan what's next. 21 days to get the body back from Vietnam. Then I would, I would help them arrange the funeral and go to the funeral. The first funeral I went to, and all of a sudden I heard this huge uproar from the back of the church. And coming up the front aisle from the back of the church is a black woman screaming at the top of her lungs, wailing and screaming. So I'm like, what? What's going on? So when she gets to the casket, I was pounding on the casket with both fists. The funeral director was sitting there, and he was very composed, hands in cold, folded in front of his uh, face, a chest, and he seemed very relaxed. I went down the next morning to the funeral home and I said, please, if possible, keep that woman away from any military funerals. You know, it's, 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 it's so upsetting. <clears throat> he calmly took out his uh, funeral checklist and check, looked at it and he said, item 17, professional mourner, $20. I met her at several other funerals. The next one she was out, I, I asked her after the service, I said, what is your role here? She said, well, your role is to talk to the people about the boy's service. He got a bronze star, he got a purple heart. Talk about his service. You do a good job at that. My job is to let the congregation, the family and the close friends, let it out one last time, scream and wail and cry. It gets it out of their system. He said, think of me as the grand finale of a fireworks show. You go and you have fireworks, and all of a sudden there's this grand finale, and you say, okay, that's good, I can go home now. That's the idea. The critical point came in March the 15th of 1966. Uh, all of a sudden, the uh, government and the Army decided that uh, since the uh, war was obviously growing increasingly unpopular by the hour, that it would be a better idea to have a military officer go out and make the initial notification. The first time I, I, I had to make a notification, I got in my car and I headed out, memorizing on the way the statement that I'd have to make. The President of the United States, the Department of the Army, the people of the United States regret to inform you that your son John Jones died as a result of a gunshot wound to the head. He died at approximately 2,300 hours on March the 23rd of 1966. I kept memorizing. That seemed to be the most important thing in my mind to get it right. But I got halfway out, and I pulled alongside the road in East Bay going to downtown Charleston. And uh, I thought to myself, I'm going to ruin a family's life. So I got to the door, knocked on the door, identified as a young uh, black mother. And I started the President of the United States, what, people, the Department of the Army, people in the United States. And of course, at that point, she collapsed to the floor of the porch. I helped her up, brought her inside, and sat her on a chair. And for whatever reason, I ran into the kitchen, got a glass of water, and brought it to her. And uh, sat down and talked to her quietly. Of course, she was obviously totally distraught. I told the, uh, the mom that I'd be going back every day to talk to her, to try to help whatever way I could, and generally guide her that between now and when the body came back 21 days later, uh, this is the procedure that we'll follow. 
I met the body at the airport, accompanied it down to the funeral home. I was asked at the funeral home to uh, please stay there while I opened the casket to inspect the body. I didn't really know that was part of the deal, but I did it. They opened the casket. I collapsed to the floor, fainted because the, the body was in such terrible shape. And went to the funeral. The um, mom asked me to sit down in front on a stool next to the casket during the service facing the congregation. I did. Uh, I'm trying to think, what, what am I going to say when I get up there? The minister made an incredible eulogy. My turn, I step up, go up to the podium, look out at the congregation and say, I envy all of you. I said, I envy you because you knew Johnny. And uh, I didn't have an opportunity to do that, so that's why I envy you. I used that same uh, speech in almost every other eulogy I went, especially if it was a black family, to relate to the, to the congregation. The most difficult individual type case I ever had to handle was suicide. Because you're required under the, under the uh, agreement to say died as a result of a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head, if that, and that's what mine was. Which of course caused complete disbelief by the family and silence. I mean, they're just look of astonishment. And then in this particular case, the mother said, that's impossible. My son is a good Christian. He would not have done something like that. That was the most difficult type of a notification to have to make. So I was 22, 23 years old, and, and most of the uh, soldiers that I was notifying the parents of were my age or younger. And so it, it, it became a, a, quite a, um, uh, I, I didn't realize it, but it obviously stressful, but very sad, but a maturing influence for sure. Then there were other notifications that basically were, one was particularly difficult, where I had gone through the whole procedure, notification, staying with the family, uh, going to the funeral, eulogizing, whatever. And uh, his brother had accompanied him back to Vietnam. In those days, you could have two members of the family there if they wanted to. So he came back. I got to know him fairly well uh, during the wake into the memorial service. And then he, uh, the day before he uh, was going to his next assignment in Germany, basically, he went out and with his friends. He got killed in a car accident that night. So my job then was to... Uh, go out at 7 o'clock the next morning and tell the family that their other son had been killed also. Now, <laughs> I got to the, the door, and as soon as I got there, they came racing out because their son had not come home for his last night home. And, I mean, the, the horror of that was unbelievable. Both sons killed uh, within a, a month of each other. And uh, that, that, that was the only time when I made my opening comment was not, uh, I envy all of you, because I, 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 I explained that to the congregation. I said, I did know Billy, and it's horrified to me because he's a wonderful, was a wonderful person. The most unusual case I had, I got a call one time, so I called the state police, and I said, uh, I'm looking for so-and-so, so-and-so. Oh, yeah, that, that exists. I don't see it on a map. It's not on the map. What do you mean it's not on the map? <laughs> well, it doesn't exist. Let's start over again. <laughs> and what it was was it was a, well, it was a Gullah Geechee community. And uh, they've been there for a couple hundred years, and they, they stay to themselves. They're, they're still, even though it's 100 years after the Civil War, the end of the Civil War, they basically, they, they're cotton farmers, and they, they do the planting and the whatever else. How am I going to get to this place? Well, my only option was to call Fort Jackson and get an Army uh, Huey H-13 helicopter. They flew down the next one, little thing with no, no you know, open sides and whatever, little bubble. And I got in the helicopter, first helicopter ride in my life, and we took off, overlooking this place, you know, in the helicopter. This looks like a Hollywood movie set for a Civil War movie. A, a dirt road, a mule-drawn buckboard going down it, and, and uh, little, look like shanties, you know, little shanties, you know, whatever, slave shanties. And there was a little general store there, and there's a black man in there, a general store owner. I, he spoke English. I talked to him, I explained why I was there. And he said, pointed, lives down the road there on the left side, third house. I knocked on the front door, no answer. And so I went down another quarter mile in the field, turned the corner, and saw the most amazing sight I could imagine. I'm looking at a cotton field with probably 25 to 30 black women in dresses on their knees or sitting picking cotton. If that wasn't enough of a sight, off in the distance I see a big white guard in a white uniform with a rifle across his chest, keeping guard on them. And uh, I, walk, I walked over to him, and I explained why I was there. I need to see this. To the, and uh, they get out, walk at sundown, come back at sundown. I said, no, I have to talk to, I have to, talk to her now. Come back at sundown. 
So I figured I wouldn't get anywhere. So I walked into the, uh, the cotton field, and I called out the last name. <clears throat> and uh, all the women pointed three rows over. So I walked, three rows up, three, I walked down the row, and uh, the woman, when she saw me, the mother, knew exactly why I was there, fell on the ground, stopped and crying. I made no present of the United States. No, I got on my knees and I hugged her for about uh, five minutes. After I'd been doing that for about a year, or say nine months, my commanding officer, in infinite wisdom, realized that this has got to be taking a toll on Lieutenant Motes because here I, I was dealing with that every single day. One day I had to do four notifications in the same day, and then and I had a funeral that, that afternoon. And bottom line, what my commanding officer realized that was then called shell shock, now called PTSD, must be settling in someplace there. So he, so he killed me and he said, I'm going to give you another assignment, additional assignment. So I said, okay, <laughs> you know, I thought I was doing enough. But he said, I, I'm going to have you, uh, tonight I'd like you to go to a Ku Klux Klan meeting up in Somerville, about 30, 40 miles north of Charleston, because I'm new to the area. I want to get an idea of how hostile they are to colored folks in these parts. So I said, okay, you're going up there undercover as a potential recruit for the KKK. The time came as the meeting was called to order outside, and uh, I, I had to go up and make a speech as to why I should want to be a KKK member. So I, I stood up there and I said, well, I don't know how to start, basically, but you know, I, you know, I came from Southern Virginia, which is a lie, and basically, uh, I of nine weeks at Fort Lee, I guess, counted for that. And I just want to say how much I love being down here in the South. You know, and I, I'm, I'm looking at your culture there, your lifestyle, and you know, I got to tell you, I love your food down here. Your Southern cooking is so good with that deep frying, man, that is so good. And I got to say, I got to love the Southern chicks down here. The Southern gals are really pretty, really pretty girls. That's all I said. I didn't say anything about how I didn't like the black folks or anything like that. I got no amens or applause. When the guy followed me, uh, N-word every other word, he got many, many amens and applause, and he obviously was their chief candidate. Kenneth called me in about a month later, and he said, I, I got another job for you. I'm going to make you the Army representative on the Armed Forces Disciplinary Control Board for the Charleston area. They're responsible for off-limits re uh, uh, responsibilities for whorehouses in the area, housing repute, brothels. And the first one we're giving you is the Sunset Lodge the legendary whorehouse in the United States at that point. So I went up to the, met them, went to their lodge, beautiful building, and I greeted the door by an absolutely drop-dead gorgeous, I'm 23 years old, drop-dead gorgeous uh, woman, young woman, offers me a glass of champagne. I explained why I'm there in my uniform, and uh, I'm here to see Miss Hazel, madam. And so I, she escorts me to her office. She was uh, in her, probably in her early 50s. But she listened to what I had to say, and she said, well, I want you to know we're very careful about our girls here. We have a, a doctor who's here every single day, examines the girls, and basically if they're having a problem, they go offline for a while until the doctor says they can go back online, and they're all well-educated. They can talk to the most of the clientele or, or people are educated, doctors, lawyers, judges. I said, well, I, I, I appreciate all that, and they, they certainly are. You know, I'm glad you take care of the medical side and whatever else, but I gotta tell them, we gotta keep you off limits. Thank God, she said, Hair, hands in the air. She said, uh, uh, the last thing I want is a lot of military people, right? We don't need military people. I got a call from a, one of the black ministers one day, and he said, um, can I come by and see you tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock? Sure, come on by. I get in this car, and we start driving south, southwest a little bit. And now we're in a little uh, village called Frogmore. Pull up in front of something called the Penn Center. That was a Southern Christian Leadership Conference headquarters for South Carolina. I got out, and uh, we, we walked to the door, and he said, somebody wants to meet you, Martin Luther King, Jr. He wants to thank you for helping his people. The last thing he said to me was, thank you for caring. That made everything worthwhile. From day one, I always intended to tell my story. Uh, but I had a 40-year career on Wall Street. <clears throat> And uh, then after that, actually during that time, I was mayor of the lake, local community, Quag, for four terms. And uh, so I was keeping busy doing that. I had four children and five children all together. I was raising them and whatever else, getting them through their, their start in life and whatever. And uh, it was one thing that uh, gave me the sign to, to write the book. In June of 2015, the terrible slaughter of nine innocent blacks at Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston. That had been the scene for 
uh, several of my memorial services, black families. Uh, one of the victims was 87-year-old Miss Susie Jackson, who had been my early mentor on how to handle a black funeral. She took nine bullets on that day. You know, 87, a wonderful person. So that, that said to me, that's a sign from above, write the book. That's what I did. 